So now the time has reached quarter past, past one, and I would like to continue our webinar on PFAS in the Nordic, Nordic region. And we arrived at the session that tell or says what more can be done. And with all the challenges and problems we've heard this morning, this is really what we need uh, to talk about now, I think. So the first speaker we have today is uh, uh, Steve Aldenes. He is a senior researcher at Institute of Marine Research in Norway. And he's going to talk about PFAS from hero to villain to criminal. So, Steve, um, not yeah, I can see you now. So you yes. turn on your camera. You're here. I'm here. And can you see me? Hear me? Yeah, I can both see you and hear you. Yes. So that's good. It would be great if you could share your slides and continue your presentation. And I look into the Q and A to see if there's any questions. And otherwise, you can answer them afterwards in writing. Uh, yes, let's see. So uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to present at this uh, webinar. Um, many interesting presentations here today. So my uh, talk is titled PFAS from hero to villain to criminal. So this is uh, going back a bit uh, with the story of fluorine and PFASs. I think it's interesting now to look at uh, how it has developed over the years, because now it seems to culminate in in uh, PFAS as being criminals. So, uh, um, but if we talk about PFAS, we talk about fluorine. So I put in two quotes here about fluorine. We're not going to go very much into the chemistry of fluorine, but I think these two kind of summarizes uh, how we can look at fluorine. Because if you look at fluorine in its elemental state as F2, which is a gas, um, it is really a very reactive element. So it's the ultimate combiner, which you can see here on the left. Also, when they have reacted, or fluorine has reacted with some other element, it will form very stable compounds. And this is where the other quote is. Um, that either you die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain, which is what I think has happened to, to PFASs. So these are man-made forever chemicals, they are called. So uh, today we are talking about climate change in many regards, and some people are still debating if that is man-made or not. But with these chemicals, there really is no doubt they are man-made chemicals. So let's go into this. So uh, I've been working with PFAS since my PhD in 2002. And at that point, we were working on synthesizing these compounds because they were envisaged to have a lot of positive uh, properties. So we tried to synthesize carbohydrate um, with the perfluoroalkylated chains attached to them. So these are also in the class of PFAS as today. Of course, we didn't want to synthesize PFAS before because they were um, because they were persistent or anything like that. We wanted to to uh, synthesize these compounds because uh, uh, they could potentially be used as artificial blood or as components in artificial blood. And as you know, blood is very complex. And that is why still today we have to go uh, those of us who are blood donors to, to donate blood several times a year because it cannot be made artificially. But in 2006, I kind of switched sides, moving into analysis and determination of these compounds and uh, has been working with that since then. And I've also been involved in, uh, in what is coming now with maximum limits and, and methods of analysis to determine these compounds in food. So uh, the outline of my talk is about, about the history of fluorine. And uh, at some point, uh, these uh, compounds were essential, actually. And they were very important. Um, also a bit about the current status, moving into the legislation, which has come now, and how um, we determine these compounds in food at our institute. 
also a bit about the future um, and how we envisage to determine these compounds in, in the future here at our institute. So where did it all start? Uh, this is uh, a picture of the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima, a terrible weapon, of course, but uh, it made the definitive end of the Second World War. And it turns out that PFASs were essential to the making of this terrible weapon. And that is because um, of the enrichment process when making enriched uranium-235. And uh, then in the process, you see, you have to make urane hexafluorine. And that is extremely corrosive, just as fluorine is. So it reacts violently. And uh, all these uranium enriching plants used uranium hexafluoride as feed. And in that process, they needed something inert. And it turned out that, uh, as we know now, of course, these perfluorinated materials are inert and um, stable. So they were essential to, to the development of this uh, terrible weapon. So, but going even further back, um, this is the, as you know, the periodic table with all the elements um, that things are made up of, things that surround us, that make up the physical world that we live in. And um, the discovery of fluorine was made by Moisson in, um, in the 1800s, and he um, got his Nobel Prize in 1906 for this work which was a great achievement because as I said, fluorine is a very reactive element. So it's difficult to, to work with. It reacts with everything except PFAS. So um, of course, fluorine is, is uh, unique like all the letters of the chemical alphabet, but as you see, it lies all the way to the top and to the right. So it's also an extreme element as we talked about just before. So this is a, a summary I made from several sources about the, yeah, the history of fluorine chemistry, really. And uh, it's kind of repeating now, I think, if you look at this, because uh, as I said, more so isolated fluorine in 1886. And then it was made possible to do some chemistry with fluorine. So several processes to, to make something useful out of fluorine was discovered. And Schwartz was a pioneer in this work. And there is this anecdote about him uh, having swallowed a few cubic centimeters of difluoroethyl alcohol in order to prove the inertness of this compound. So already then we see that PFAS says, yeah, they are inert and stable. And he demonstrated that in class to his students. But anyway, uh, the first application of uh, fluorinated chemicals was uh, what we call freons, used in refrigerators, among other things. And um, as we know today, freons are uh, a big problem for the ozone layer. But I didn't know that at that time, of course. But this was a big leap forward, because before they had freons, they had to use other gases like uh, ammonia, for instance, which is very toxic if it is released. And as I talked about, these uh, fluorinated chemicals are much more inert. So it was a big leap forward with regards to safety and uh, paved the way for everybody to have a refrigerator in their house, of course. So, but uh, in 1938, uh, Plunkett discovered PTFE, or Teflon as we call it, which was a polymer of Freon 2022. 20, uh, and you see here a picture of him and his colleagues, which uh, are digging out PTFE from gas cylinder, cylinders of uh, Freon 22. This was also a very important discovery. And uh, yeah, Teflon is used still today. So, uh, in 1948, the last publication on PFASs was made, I think, because during the war, of course, uh, nothing was published in this regard. But as I told you, 
it was very important for the development of of uh, of the war and of course the the ending of the second world war so but after the war they um, the publication started to arise of work which really had been going on during the war and they published uh, the polymers they used and so and so the um, processes they used to to manufacture this so in the aftermath of the war of course you had a big industry also which um, made these uh, perfluorinated chemicals so that also opened the way for uses because they have unique properties these PFASs and uh, as we have seen in um, this webinar they are used pretty much everywhere today so uh, of course they were discovered in in um, in um, general population in the late 1990s maybe and uh, just before that actually the CFC were banned so it will be interesting now to see with a ban of uh, PFASs how that will turn up and uh, because PFASs are still used as you see here on the list in many essential applications like medicinal chemistry for instance so with PFASs, there is a lot of compounds, as we have uh, seen in many of the presentations today, and, and sometimes uh, just a few of them are uh, actually measured and determined. Um, so um, the, the aim here from, from EU is to manage them as a group, because there are so many compounds. And the benefits of PFAS is, is, as I talked about, that they have unique properties and they are really essential to certain application. So they cannot easily be replaced. However, the, ris the risks are, of course, that they have persistence and they have negative health effects. And also, as I said, there is a lot of unknown compounds here, probably thousands, if not millions. It depends on the definition of PFAS. So as many of you have talked about, the uses should be limited to essential uses. So maximum limits is food. That has come now in an um, EU at least, in this regulation, 9.15.2023. And um, that is based on, on, of course, what is actually present in food. There was done a risk assessment by AFSA. And uh, based on the risk assessment and the TWI from EFSA, one can calculate the estimate on a toxicological base. What should you be able to determine in food in order to, to check this? That depends, on, of course, on the TWI, the consumption and the contribution of this PFAS to the intake. Then again, you have to determine this in the food. So you also have to look at what can reasonably be achieved analytically when determining these compounds in food. And also in the end, as some of you said, the maximum limit has to take into account that uh, not all the food can be uh, categorized as contaminated. So the aim here is to remove the most contaminated food. So we have ended up with uh, maximum limits, which are uh, at or above the LOQ, which can be achieved analytically. So uh, this is uh, the maximum limits currently for uh, seafood. Of course, there are other maximum limits for other food, but these are really the, the, the uh, maximum limits important for our institute. So the lowest is 0 0.2, as you see, and there is also a maximum limit for the sum of the four PFASs, which have been assessed by by EFSA. So the current method at uh, our institute is uh, pretty much the same as many other labs use. It is, um, of course, first we sample, do the sample preparation, which includes uh, uh, weighing of uh, one gram approximately of sample, adding internal standards, doing an extraction uh, using sonication, and then purification using solid phase extraction. Today we use an LC MSMS analysis for the determination of these compounds and report the results. So 
But we are just in the transition from this uh, MSMS you see here on the left to this orbit trap system, which is a high resolution system. So the benefit of course of the, the triple quad on the left is that you, you can target specific compounds and get sensitive methods. Um, but uh, of course the downside is um, you get some noise in your analysis and this, um, yeah, it's a problem for your um, quantification limit. If you look at the orbit trap, it's uh, very sensitive and it has a very high uh, selectivity. It's a high resolution instrument, so you can have very little noise in your spectra as you see. So we are just transitioning into this high res uh, technique now. And here are some uh, results of the ongoing validation uh, of the new method on a new instrument. So um, now there are uh, requirements in the European law as regards the precision and trueness of these um, methods that are going to be used. And you see here the criteria is 80 to 120% <coughs> when it comes to trueness and plus minus 20% in precision. So um, this method looks okay as far. We are just wrapping up the writing the, the papers on this one now so that it can be put into production. But in the future, as I said, there is a lot of these compounds and you see this maximum limit is only for four of these compounds. Of course, uh, methods usually include uh, more compounds, 20, 30 maybe, it depends. But still, it's just a small fraction of of uh, what is actually out there when it comes to PFASs. So, so this is just a layout of how you can determine to total fluorine content and has been used in, in publications over many years now. And um, the point is that you have a total fluorine content in, in something and you can determine this using, for instance, NMR, because uh, NMR is, uh, yeah. You can use on uh, fluorine 19 and fluorine 19 is the only isotope of, of uh, fluorine. Uh, you can use other techniques also, of course, but the downside of that is that you also include inorganic fluorine. So you have to separate it out so that you measure the organic fluorine because that is uh, where the PFAS are found. Then you can also, of course, uh, separate that into an extractable and a non-extractable uh, fraction which you can again determine using combustion and a more IR ashing or something like that. Um, then again, the extractable, you can uh, separate into known extractable fluorine, organic fluorine, which we can determine using these um, triple quad instruments where we know what we are looking for. However, as I said, most of these PFASs are unknown perhaps. So that's where we also need the orbit trap because we can get the full MS spectra uh, of every uh, scan of the mass spectrometer. So we cannot in the future, I think, just have one technique, one uh, instrument, one method to do a PFAS analysis. We need to have several different kinds of techniques and methods. And that is uh, where I have this uh, table on the left here, you see. So the, it, depending on what kind of question we want to answer with the analysis, we have to select the right method. So if you're just interested in which analytes are present in a sample, we have to have a method which is selective, like the Orbit Trap, which is very selective as a high res instrument. We can also have a screening techniques to see if something is above or below a certain level. Then we have to determine some kind of uh, cutoff limit for the method called LOD, LOQ, whatever. And um, we can also of course quantify using different techniques, both of these instruments for instance, to see how much is actually in the sample. Uh, then we can uh, screen the samples and uh, precision is a very important parameter for that. If we're going to compare our results with say a maximum limit or something outside of the method, then of course the trueness is also very important. So uh, 
I think uh, in the future, going forward, it's very uh, necessary to have a performance criteria, which are set now for maximum limits, so that we can implement methods that can meet these criteria, uh, instead of having uh, uh, methods that are designed um, for the specific purpose, so that each lab can select the best approach to determining this in the future. So we are also working on going into the non-target uh, qualitative screening uh, method terrain. And for this purpose, you can use different workups. Of course, the workup may influence what kind of PFAS is, as I showed you on the previous slides that you finally have in your extract. But you can put this extract on your instrument and get the full MS spectra like here. Of course, that generates a lot of data and you have to do data analysis using uh, something like Compound Discover in this case. And in this program, you can filter and treat your data so that you can actually find this PFASs, which have specific properties, uh, which can be looked at in, in such a setting. And here you see some results from my colleague, Asim Ali, demonstrating that you can uh, look at homolog series of uh, PFAS using these uh, um, software uh, techniques really to filter your data. So this is the future. I think we have to look for uh, um, PFAS, not just four or 20 or 30 compounds. We have to look at uh, PFAS as a class. And uh, this is a new project we have now. Uh, where Asim Ali is the project le leader. And um, the project is called Fearless and it's investigating how marine organisms uh, could be imp impacted by PFAS as the precursors and also the alternatives, which are of course coming now that PFAS are being phased out. And uh, in this regard, it's important to explore the transfer and the transformation of these unknown uh, PFAS in marine food webs. So this is a collaboration with NMBU, University in Bergen and Colorado School of Mines. So this is my last slide. So I want to thank you all for listening. And um, I think the, the, the quote here from, from um, Bruce E. Smart in DuPont is still valid that the future of Lurin still rests with the products, processes, a business that it uniquely enables because fluorine is such a unique element. Uh, we can never go back to where we were. There will still be uses of fluorine in the future. And uh, all, as I told you, all of these PFAS are man-made. And that is quite interesting now with the search for extraterrestrial life. What we should be looking for is PFAS, I think, because if you have PFAS, you know there is intelligent life. And also maybe more scary, they probably also have weapons of mass destruction, as I told you. So that concludes the talk for me. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Steve. Very exciting and a quite a new angle you put on here at last. Um, and thank you for the screen methods. I can see just one question coming up, but maybe because of time, you could look into that in your Q&A session and answer it. I can see a lot of answers have come in. Because then I would like to turn to the next speaker. And it's Professor Lutz Ahrens, and you're from Department of Aquatic Sciences and Assessment in the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And you're going to talk about PFAS treatment techniques, needs for the future. And we definitely need those, I think. And it looks fine. I can see it in presentation mode. So Lutz, please, please take the floor. Thank you so much for the invitation to give a talk in this uh, seminar. So, yeah, as you said, my name is Lutz Ahrens. I'm professor in environmental organic chemistry. I work at the Department of Aquatic Science Assessment at SLU in Uppsala. And my talk today will be about PFAS treatment techniques and what is the needs for the future. And as we have heard on the previous talk, PFAS are used in many, many different uh, products. It's a 
humongous uh, number of, some of different uh, consumer products or uh, industrial products where these chemicals are used. So they have really useful properties. And how do they circulate in the environment from the industry um, that can be used and um, produced in many different consumer articles? Um, one um, important application in terms of uh, environmental contamination is also used in firefighting form. From all this application and usage and end of life of the articles, um, they can end up in the waste facilities, landfills, but also wastewater treatment plant. From there, they can finally end up in the environment, both in the atmosphere, terrestrial, also in the aquatic environment. And from there, they can go into our food chain, both drinking water, but also in our food. And in the end, um, we can be exposed by these chemicals. And my talk is focusing about the treatment option. So how can we break this chain that these contaminants can be released into the environment? And how can we protect uh, the ex human exposure by these very, very persistent chemicals? And... Um, when we talk about drinking water, guidelines are really important because when we want to treat any kind of water, we need a, a guideline value until which level we want to, what is our goal to treat the water. And in Sweden, very early on, um, we implemented a guideline value. In 2013, we already had a guideline value of 90 nanogram per liter for the sum of seven PFAS, as you see here on my list. In 2016, uh, the National Food Ag Agency in Sweden, they updated the guideline value to 11 PFAS and they kept it at 90 nanogram per liter. So they made it even more strict in terms of individual PFAS. And as you have heard about uh, in the EU, there has been a new uh, regulation, also an update of the drinking water guidelines of 100 nanogram per liter for the sum of 20 PFAS and 500 nanogram per liter for the total um, organic fluorine or total PFAS. And this has, been, has to be implemented in the national guidelines in all the EU member states. In Sweden, the plan is to start um, with a guideline value in, uh, in this year that we have for the sum of PFAS 2100 nanogram per liter. So in comparison to the EU guideline, we have added also the 6.2 FTSA. And we also have included the total, the total PFAS of 500 nanogram per liter. In addition to the EU guideline, um, Sweden is also implementing um, the EFSA recommendation for the sum of four PFAS, as you see, PFA, PFNA, PFHEXA, S, and PFOS, which was mentioned in the previous um, presentation, also for fish and seafood, of four nanogram per liter in drinking water. And this has to be um, this. Treatment goal is required from 20, 2026. So quite soon in two and a half years um, to um, yeah, reach this treatment goal. And these treatment goals are really important in terms of when we think about treatment techniques and removal of PFAS because um, we need some kind of goal. What is the treatment goal? Because we never get down to zero nanogram per liter. Um, I will talk about a case study in Uppsala. And here um, is shown um, the city of Uppsala with the groundwater, which you see in the blue, which is coming from the north going to the south. And we have two main drinking water plants in Uppsala, one in the north, as you can see the uh, yellow square, and one in the south. And then we have the Swedish defense park. Um, department which used firefighting form over decades, PFAS containing firefighting forms, and they have uh, contaminated um, our groundwater with PFAS. And you can see the plume coming out from the defense department and um, contaminating the drinking water source in Uppsala. And especially the drinking water plant in the south is affected, as you can see from the plume. And they were very, very lucky that in the north, the drinking water plant has not or very little been affected by the PFAS contamination plume. And as we have seen from previous studies, um, conventional classical drinking water treatment plants 
cannot really remove PFASs. So what we observe from our monitoring on conventional classical drinking water plants is whatever PFAS is going into the plant going out. So there's no real removal uh, for this drinking water uh, treatment. And the reason is they are not designed to remove these chemicals. PFASs are very persistent and mobile chemicals, and these drinking water plants are not designed to remove these chemicals. They're designed to remove particles, they're designed to remove organic matter, pathogens, but not really these very mobile and persistent compounds. And right now in our raw water, we have 100 to 200 nanogram per liter for the sum of 21 PFASs. And in addition, we have 80 nanogram per liter for the sum of four PFASs. And coming back to the guideline values, both, guideline, both levels are above the guideline value. For PFAS 21 of 100 nanogram per liter and even 20 times higher than the goal of four PFASs of four nanogram per liter. So the question is, what can we do? Um, the guideline values are implemented now, um, so we have to reach the drinking water uh, guidelines. In terms of PFAS treatment option in the following, I will present some um, yeah, treatment option for removal of PFASs in the water phase. And there I will distinguish between three different options. So one is about concentrating. So you have a large volume of water, which is PFAS contaminated water, and you concentrate it to a smaller volume of waste stream. We, I call it concentration method. Then there are adsorption treatments. So you see you have some kind of sorbent which can uh, sorb, remove PFASs, and degradation treatment techniques. Starting with the uh, concentration treatment techniques. The first treatment option uh, I would like to present are membranes. Both nanofiltration and reverse osmosis have been shown to be very efficient in terms of removal of PFASs. Here's shown a schematic um, where we have tested membrane nanofiltrations. And the principle is that the water, the raw water is pushed with a high pressure through the membranes. And um, the water which is passing the membrane, which is called the permeate, um, we see that most PFASs, in our case, more than 98% of the PFASs were removed because PFASs are not passing this field or this membrane. They are kind of rejected. So we call the water which is not passing the membrane reject water. However, we have just as I said, it's a concentration treatment technique. So we produce uh, reject water with highly concentrated PFASs. And for membrane, it can be 15 to 20% reject water, which needs to be also treated because we cannot just release it into the environment. So what did we do? So we used the membrane to concentrate the waste stream and produced PFAS concentrated reject water. And then the reject water we treated with uh, granulated activated carbon. It's called GUC in this uh, schematic, and onion exchange, AIX, which is called in this. And then we compared uh, the two treatment options. So the first one is we treat raw water directly with activated carbon and onion exchange. And the second option, we use this treatment train using membranes, concentrating the um, PFASs, and then using GUC activated carbon and onion exchange. So we compare these two treatment options, direct treatment or membrane and then treatment. And then we looked at the removal of PFASs, um, total removal of PFASs per uh, gram adsorbent. And when we looked for the first treatment, just directly raw water, which is labeled with a one, um, here you can see um, how much PFASs in total were removed using onion exchange and granulated activated carbon. And then on the right side, you see the treatment train using first membrane and then treating the re reject water with activated carbon and onion exchange. And what we could show here with this experiment is by combining membrane with uh, activated carbon onion exchange, we have a 2.6 factor 2.6 uh, higher removal efficiency using granulated activated carbon and over a factor four better removal efficiency using onion exchange. So it was more efficient to concentrate the waste stream first 
and then treat only the concentrated rays. So we treat a smaller volume of water. Um, another concentration treatment technique I would like to present to you is foam fractionation. It has gotten quite a lot of attention in the recent years. And how does it work? It's a very simple treatment technique. You inject air in a column. So this, you create bubbles. And since PFASs have surfactant characteristics, they are attached um, to the bubbles and then to the foam, which are created on the top of the bubbles. So PFASs are very strong surfactants and very easily removed um, using this kind of foam fractionation. And then the foam can be um, collected in a separate uh, container so you can reach very high concentration factors. But important again, this is a concentration treatment. So you concentrate the PFASs into a very small uh, volume, which needs to be further treated. And here on the right side, you see the results for the foam fractionation. On the y-axis, you see the um, percentage removal efficiency. So 100% means everything is removed. And, the, and based on the perfluorocarbon chain lengths for perfluorosulfonates and perfluorocarboxylates. And the main thing you can see is that we reach very high removal efficiency for the longer chain, both sulfonates like PFOS, and carboxylates like PFA, more than 90%, 95% is removed of these long chain PFASs. On the other hand, we see lower removal efficiency of the short chain PFASs. There we go down to 40 or even below 20%. So this treatment or removal efficiency is a uh, treatment technique is very efficient for long chain PFASs. The second uh, treatment option is adsorption treatment. Most commonly used nowadays has been activated carbon. And more and more in common is, is also onion exchange. So activated carbon is a big advantage. It has a very, very large surface area where PFASs, we can see here, symbolize they can sorb to this activated carbon in different ways. They can sorb with their hydrophobic chain. They can sorb with their ionic interaction, or even my cells. So there are a lot of different ways how these PFASs can sorb to this activated carbon, and I will call GAC in the following. Onion exchange has shown also be very efficient in removal of PFASs. The advantage is it has, it, um, it can sorb, PFASs are negatively charged, and this onion exchange is able to sorb PFASs with this uh, anionic um, exchange. And here are, for example, two papers we have recently published on this topic. And when we look at the removal efficiency here as an example for using activated carbon, again, removal efficiency on the y-axis and on the x-axis, we see the time axis. So we have run the experiment over 217 days, representing a wet volume of 50,000. So if you start from the left side in the beginning of the um, experiment, we had 100% removal of all the different PFASs you can see here. And then over time, the removal efficiency gradually decrease. And for the longer chain PFASs, like even for tetra deca uh, acid or PFOS, we see still in the end of the experiment, high removal over 80%. On the other hand, for the short chain PFASs, we see a much steeper decrease in the removal efficiency over time. And after around 100 days or 22,000 bed volumes, we see even desorption of the very short chain PFBA from the column. So what's happening there? So PFAS, PFBA, the short chain PFASs, get sorbed um, to the GAC activated carbon from 0 to 100 days. But then we see a desorption effect. So the PFBRA gets replaced by the longer chain PFASs or other chemicals and get desorbed. So we see higher amount of PFBA coming out of the column, which is going into the column. So we see a desorption of PFBA or negative removal efficiency. 
And this is a general problem of all different types of solvents we have tested. It's the same for onion exchange and different types of activated carbon or different types of solvents. The short chain PFOSs are the most difficult to remove in water. In PFBA, I put here on purpose because PFBA is also in included in the drinking water guideline. How does it look in Uppsala's drinking water plant? Right now, we actually use activated carbon for removal of PFASs. So that's why I want to show you the example. So this is the full scale drinking water plant example. We have the raw water from the groundwater coming in with 100 to 200 nanogram per liter for the sum of 21 PFASs and around 80 nanogram per liter for sum of four PFASs. The treatment process, um, it starts very classical, first the softening and then sand filter. At these two steps, no PFOSs are removed. And then they have implemented 10 activated carbon beds where PFOSs are uh, passing through with an empty bed contact time of 14 to 19 minutes. And here is really, we see the rem removal of PFOSs. And in the end, it's a chlorination and finished drinking water. And the finished drinking water right now um, has around 25 nanogram per liter for the sum of 21 PFOSs. So we are below the uh, drinking water limit of 100. And we see between four and five nanogram for four PFOSs. So we are just on the edge, a bit above the current the drinking water guideline, which is coming right now. However, the big disadvantage is these activated carbon filters get saturated. So every seven, eight months, they have to replace the whole activated carbon beds. Um, it's sent right now to Germany for regeneration, and then it's coming back to Sweden. But it's a huge cost every year to regenerate all the activated carbon. So I will talk a bit more about this uh, drinking water plant since we have now a plan how, how to optimize this treatment process. Then there are also degradation treatment techniques. Very short, there are many different options right now published. They're more small bench scale, I would say. Here as an example, electrochemical oxidation, you go with a high um, energy. So you break down PFAS, the long chain to a shorter, shorter chain and mineralize PFASs in the end. And here we have um, used it with PFAS contaminated water. Here's shown the removal of PFOS and PFOA using electrochemical oxidation. And you can see over time uh, the PFOS is degrading and PFOA even steeper uh, removal de uh, degradation rate. However, again, shorter chain PFOSs are a little bit more difficult to break down. They're more mobile, they're shorter chain. We see for P Penta S, we see even an increase and then decrease. And the reason is that the longer chain PFOSs are degrading to shorter chain PFOSs. So we see an increase of shorter chain and then a decrease. Same so for BFBA, we see a small increase and then a decrease. Again, the longer chain PFOSs are degrading to shorter chain PFOSs. And now I put all together all the different treatment options in terms of stage of development from the y-axis and range of practicability from not available to base feasible. And in the top right corner, so the most uh, efficient uh, treatment options are um, activated carbon, onion exchange, membranes. So they can be used already in full-scale treatment plants for removal of PFASs. Very promising is also foam fractionation. And then there are a large number of other treatment techniques which are right now more bench scale tested. And we have right now a current project in terms of how can we produce sustainable drinking water? How can we change our drinking water process to really um, get down the drinking water, uh, the, the limits down to the current drinking water guidelines. Very, very short. Um, we have different types of raw water. We have four different uh, drinking water producers in Sweden, Uppsala Vatten, Sydvatten, Norvatten, Stockholm Vatten. They have all different types of raw water. Two of them have artificial infiltration. The other two have a 
the lake water. We start with a membrane. We concentrate PFASs. We create drinking water, which is almost free of PFASs. And the reject water, we use a treatment train using foam fractionation, which I've presented before, using a pellet reactor, biological treatment, ion access change, electrochemical oxidation to degrade PFASs. And then in the end, we can reuse the water. So this is the idea we are right now working on. And the first re pre preliminary results we have done so far is we have feed water of 77 nanogram per liter of PFASs. We have a two-stage nanofiltration membrane. We could use drinking water with only 1.4 nanogram per liter of the sum of PFASs. And this can be used for drinking water. And then the reject water, which is around 20% of the whole volume, we concentrate further. So from 388, we concentrate this water with over, over 3,000 nanogram per liter. And this can be degraded using, for example, electrochemical oxidation. And then uh, the, the remaining water can be then released into the environment with levels between 35 and 21 nanogram per liter for the sum of PFASs, and we can reuse. Take home message um, each treatment technique has their advantage and disadvantage. And so the combination of different treatment options is oft the best solution. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. I think it was a, a very nice presentation and, and enlightening. Um, I can see you actually answered one of the questions in the Q&A. And the other one is a little bit more technical on activated carbo, uh, carbon thing treatment. So please go in the Q&A and, and, and try to answer that one. And then I'll turn to the next speaker here. So, and you stop sharing and thank you so much for a great talk. Thank the you. next uh, speaker we have today is strategic advisor, Jenny Iverson from Swedish Chemical Agency. And you're going to, your title of the talk is Proposal for Broad PFAS Restriction in EU. And we already heard a little bit about this restriction proposal, but would you please take the floor? Jenny Iverson? Yes, thank you. Um... Yes, this looks great. Can you see it now? Yeah, Good. it looks fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Well, uh, thanks yeah. for giving me the opportunity to present this uh, proposal for a broad PFAS restriction in the EU, and it's within the REACH uh, uh, regulation. And maybe you have heard some of this uh, already today, and uh, some of the issues I will speak about. But I will shortly give you a short background and then go into the actual proposal and the what's the next step. So yes, uh, I'm Jenny Iverson, and I'm from the Swedish Chemicals Agency. Uh, and this is uh, joint efforts by five European countries, uh, Denmark, uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, the Netherlands and uh, uh, Germany. Uh, and in uh, addition, ECHA uh, has supported the work by contributing uh, to many discussions and providing advice based on their experience. So we have been working together since January 2020, uh, collecting the um, necessary information and uh, drafting the proposal, uh, the uh, actual, the, the so-called Annex 15 restriction dossier. And uh, the information was uh, gathered to through two consultations, um, in one in there in from. Uh, uh, May and to July in 2020, and one July 21 to October 2021. And uh, we put a lot of effort in reaching out to industry for, for the different uses. And uh, the proposal was then submitted in mid-January this year, and was uh, the report was published on ECA's web page in, in February. So, uh, and so I guess you are familiar with this, but I just want to give your, you our, um, what we base our hazard assessment on and uh, the reason why we see a need for a broad EU restriction. 
Uh, and that is that the common property of all PFAS um, is that they are extremely persistent. And as you are aware, they are either persistent themselves or they degrade into other persistent PFAS, which will not degrade. And so they will just stay in the environment. Uh, and if emissions continue, PFAS concentrations in the environment will um, progressively increase in water, soil, and sediment. And uh, in addition uh, to the high persistence, uh, PFAS also have other concerning properties, which uh, enlarge the concern. Some are, are documented to be toxic, uh, other properties we see as mobility and bioaccumulation, and we have also the uh, ED properties for some. So this is kind of our, our results here you see, and Lutz also showed this life cycle picture before. Uh, and uh, here you see this from the, uh, from the top left, we have the PFAS production where you have manufacture of PFAS such as uh, fluoropolymers. And then we have the production of products. For example, we have you know, non-stick frying pans, we have clothing but also different kind of mixtures such as cleaning agents and lubricants. And then we, in the next step, we go into the use stage uh, where these products uh, are used by consumer professionals and industry. And after that, the products enter the uh, waste stage, um, uh, which involve different types of handling, such as incineration, of course. And uh, since emissions to the environment occur at all stages, uh, all life cycles are accounted for in the restriction proposal. And our estimate is that 70, approximately 75,000 tons uh, PFAS are emitted in, the, in Europe uh, every year. And this is based on data from um, 2020 which means that emissions will increase uh, over time if no action is taken. And it's important to emphasize that these numbers do not include, include the waste stage uh, since this uh, we could not quantify the, these numbers. So the emissions are uh, actually much uh, higher than these 75,000 tons. And then, some more of our results. Here is the results of the tonnage and emissions based on different uses. And uh, you see here, the darker the color, the higher the value. And highest tonnage range for six uses there. You can see and that uh, applications of fluorinated gases being the sector with the highest tonnage range. And if you look into the uh, third column, the with the blue um, shades, uh, you see the emission range. And that means the uh, share of the tonnage that is emitted to the environment. And the last column, the green, with the, with the green, green shades, uh, you, uh, that is a combination of the tonnage and the emission range, uh, giving the concentration uh, to the overall uh, emissions. So now I'm coming into the actual proposal uh, and I need to emphasize that this is a proposal that is now being processed in the uh, EU uh, scientific committees. Um, so this is what it looks like now. We don't know what it will look like at the end. But uh, the proposal we have the, is the chemical definition. It is based on the OECD PFAS definition from 2021, and that is that the, the, we uh, define the uh, PFAS as any substance that contain at least one fully fluorinated methyl or methylene carbon um, and without any hydrogen, chlorine, brom bromine, or iodine attached to it. And here is you can see that this is a very heterogeneous group. We have this classic PFAS, as you know, uh, has been uh, restricted for a long time through the uh, POPs uh, regulation uh, and I mean, globally the Stockholm Convention, but in, in Europe, we 
it's uh, implemented through the POPs regulation. And we have other ones with, you can see only like one small carbon fluorine uh, at the end. And the PTFE, which is uh, the fluoropolymer. And here also demonstration of the different uses. Uh, the PFOS was a classic, you know, the firefighting foam chemical. And we have the PTFE, for example, in non-sticky fly frying pans. And here we have more of a F gas and also with the, we have several of them in the, in the um, or several, but we have some in the uh, pesticide use. And Within the scope, we have a few specific uh, PFAS that can be completely degraded in the environment. So uh, therefore, we have excluded them from the scope. And here are some examples of these. They, they are mostly uh, the ones used in the plant protection uh, products. And we can see here that they have this uh, carbon or nitrogen attached to it. And uh, we propose a, 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 a limit uh, of uh, for ban on use manufacturer use and places on the market. We have uh, we propose a twenty five ppb for any PFAS, and uh, and then is that is uh, based on those targeted uh, analyses. And we have two hundred and fifty ppb for the sum of PFAS. Uh, and uh, to also we also include the fluoropolymers. We also have a, a limit for uh, of uh, fifty ppm uh, for the total fluoride content. And uh, in the proposal, we describe two restriction options: um, arrow one and arrow two. And that is described described in detail, uh, and we compare them uh, with each other. And and restriction option one is a full ban of all uses with a general transitional period of eighteen months. And uh, the restriction option two that we have assessed is a ban with use specific derogations. And that option also has, has a general transitional period of 18 months, um, but we have the time limited uh, derogations of either five years or 12 years. And we have some specific uh, time unlimited derogations, which is very specific. Um, the, uh, there is uh, active substances in biocidal products, plant protection products and pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the reason why we propose this derogation is that they have their own le legislations that the uh, PFAS should be handled within uh, instead of within the REACH uh, regulation. And we also have this F gas uh, refrigerants um, in, in buildings where national safety standards and building codes prohibit the use of alternatives. So that is a safety bar. Uh, matter here and also we have calibration of measurements in, in measurement instruments uh, and as analytical reference ma materials so that is more in a, a laboratory environment and here you can see kind of a, it's the same uh, here you can this you can see this entry into force and we have this uh, restriction option one ban without a derogation after 80 months and uh, we have after five year uh, derogation uh, five year plus uh, 80 months with this entry into um, with this transitional period means after six and a half years those uh, derogation will be um, prohibited and then we have this 12 year derogation which means uh, with the 80 month transitional period that means uh, 13 and a half years and we have those that I showed at the last slide is uh, time unlimited derogations. And I should say that uh, we propose the, um, uh, we assess that the restriction option two, uh, this one to be the best uh, uh, option. It's most proportionate because then we could, we have a, 
uh, uh, we have a decrease of the emissions to the environment, but at the same time, we can continue use those um, for the, I mean, PFAS can be used for those applications that are, that are necessary uh, for society. And here I'm just giving two examples of this five year and 12 years uh, uh, derogation. Um, in the proposal, you can see a long list of them, but they are very specific. And one here, this is a fluoropolymer uh, derogation when it comes to food contact materials for industrial food and feed production. And that means it's not food contact materials, but it, 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 it in the process when where they are the food is produced. Uh, fluoropolymers are used. And there we see that alternatives are under development, but not available uh, at the, the entry into force. And one other example is implantable medical device. Uh, there we see that the alternatives need to be identified and developed and certified before they could be used. So there we see a need for a uh, derogation uh, um, uh, on for 12 years. And also here, maybe it's a lot of technical details here, but we also propose a reporting requirements um, uh, in connection with the uh, derogations. And that is, for example, for the ex active substances in the pharmaceuticals, uh, plant protection products and biocide, we, we um, propose that they they uh, submit information on the use, and that is the same for the uses of fluorinated gases and uses with a 12-year derogation period. And the reason for this is that we will gather more information to see where the PFAS actually are used. And also we propose a management plan requirement for a site-specific site management plan in relation to the use of uh, fluoropolymers and uh, perfluoropolyethers. And that is uh, targeted to the manufacturers, importers, and downstream users. And they should then uh, include in this management plan identify uh, and identify uh, identity of the PFAS and the justification for the use, conditions of use, and safe disposal. And here is just a, a slide for the, con what will this mean then for the environment This, uh, if, this uh, if this restriction is implemented? Well, we can see that if no action is taken, uh, our uh, estimates is that um, the use will be 49 million ton. And that is for the uh, sectors that I showed earlier, the ones that we have been investigated. And the release during manufacturing use will be 4.5 million tons. And the difference here is the waste stage. So, and so the uh, emissions to the environment will be higher than this 4.5 million tons, but we, we are not, we are not been able to quantify the waste uh, emissions. And with the full ban, uh, then we uh, have a reduction with by 96%. And the reason why it's not 100% since this is a total ban is that we have this 18 month transitional period. And the, the option that we propose this ban with time limited derogation, um, we, um, we see that emissions will obviously be higher than the uh, restriction option one, uh, but we don't have an actual number yet. Uh, calculations uh, are in progress. We uh, are now waiting also for uh, new information here, so we could conclude this. But just to, my, this is my last slide to just the conclusion and the next step. Um, so we see that there is a need for an EU-wide restriction um, for PFAS, and that is based on identified risks, and that is. Uh, mainly due to their extreme persistency. Um, and we also see that the REACH regulation is the most effective tool to regulate PFAS within the EU. 
And we also have concluded that uh, restriction option two is the most effective mes measure to reduce environmental emissions. And then we have this, uh, that is a total ban where, that we had use specific derogation and also in this combination with reporting requirements and this, the management plan. And um, we estimate that the, uh, uh, the, the emission reduction would be 96% if we have this total ban, but it will be uh, uh, higher with this uh, uh, use-specific derogations. And also that, that we see that this is appropriate measure to address this risk uh, within a reasonable time frame. Uh, now there is an ongoing uh, consultation uh, open for everyone until the 25th of se uh, September. And so far we have received ECA, that is through ECA's webpage, you submit that information, and we have received uh, over 3,500 comments so far, and so that we haven't seen the end yet. Um, and also now what we are working on is updating the proposal um, based on the recommendation we have for the scientific com committees of ECA. Uh, but also then we will um, uh, update also information uh, based on what will be submitted through the uh, consultation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, even though the time is up, there's actually two very interesting questions, and they have been posed a little bit during the day as well. What mm -hmm. about medical devices, and what about coatings of medicine, and mm -hmm. is, are those included in this ban? Yes, uh, they are. I mean, uh, as I said, but what we have this uh, time unlimited derogation when it comes to pharmaceuticals is for the act active substance. But we have, we are aware that this is, you know, it is a complex uh, use that PFAS are used in many other, you know, steps in the in the manufacturing and also, as you say, it could be used in the coatings and so on. So, and also, yes, medical device. We have some derogations that, uh, as I said, implant, um, uh, for example, but they are included. But as also I said, that this is so far only a proposal. So we uh, we are working on it. So. Yes, but they are included in the proposal. Thank you so much. And there might come some more questions in the Q&A, so you can go in and have a look and answer directly. So, so and everybody can see those as well. But thank you very much for your presentation. And I would actually like to go to the next session. And, and that's about concluding up on what we have done today. And here we'll start again with a Minty. So please go to menti.com and enter the numbers you see on the screen, and I hope they'll come up soon. And when you're ready, you can give a thumbs up like you did beforehand. And the question is, what is, in your opinion, the most important to focus on in the coming years? And you can pick and prioritize three out of the 10 options and drag and drop them, uh, and drop the free items, submit and return to the Zoom meeting. I hope this is understandable. So what are your three top priorities for the next 10 years? And as I can see it, it's research within different types of PFASs. Nope, now it's changing. Research into which substances PFAS can be replaced with. Yes, definitely interesting and research within connection between PFAS exposure and health outcomes, more public knowledge about PFAS, more communication, yes, um, and research within different types of PFASs. Oh yeah, actually many of these get high numbers of answers and I can understand that as well. So far it's research into what PFAS can be substituted with, replaced with. That's on first place. I think that's a good choice, actually. And as you finish up going into that, we'll go back to the Zoom meeting, all of us now. And as you know, we were four Nordic uh, organizations and then four Nordic countries arranging this webinar. And I would like actually to give the, short, uh, to the word shortly to each one of them. So Harald Gjein, are you here still? Director of the Norwegian Scientific Committee for Food and Environment. 
Hello, Christian. Yeah, hi, Harald. I remember you you actually proposed this webinar from the beginning. So what have you thought about today? Thank you. First of all, I think this is, have been an extremely interesting and very, very good day. I'm really impressed of how much knowledge uh, that we have got out of this day. You, Christian, you asked a very, very central and good questions in the start of the day. And I think that we have got a lot of answers on that questions, but of course, we have also got new uh, questions. We have got new uh, things to think about, about this very, very important theme. Uh, and I think I, I shall just put off some, some of the most interesting things that I have heard today. I think it's very, very good to see that all the uh, all the presentation we have heard today, they are very good connected. We see that this is a problem that we will have to solve in a way. But we also hear that this is, as you also started to say, this is an everlasting chemical that we have brought into this world. But as we heard that Stig said, it's also many good uh, things about PFAS. We don't, we have to remember that. So I think uh, we shall look how shall we work with this in the future. And I think one main point is cooperation. Cooperation between researchers, authorities, consumers, and I have to look at my notes, and industry, of course. Cooperation, as we heard, I think Lena said, and many have been said, that we have some PFAS that we could, could get rid of soon, that we don't need. We have some PFAS that we could substitute with other uh, non-toxic agents, and so on. So we have some PFAS that maybe we have to live with in medicals, in other, uh, in other stuffs. And then it's important to see how could we to reduce the effects of that PFAS in uh, so, such a ways. So I think we have got a lot of knowledge today and we know what's going on. But I think that we have to to still have this, um, maybe we should have this uh, kind of webinar uh, next year or in two years. And I will also mention that you all know that there is a very good cooperation also now in EFSA. And that is important that EFSA are looking at this. Because as we heard in the start of, the, um, of this, this seminar, the main source for a human and the most important for the human health is the food and everything that is going into the environment in is in some or another way coming back to us by feed by animals by drinking water and so on so then we get it into us by the food so i think it's very important that efsa have a central role here but also that we in northern nordic region can still work with this so at last thank you very much christine an excellent lead of this uh, webinar and of course to all of the uh, contributions that have done all this as a, to this a very 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 uh, knowledge day for us all thank you thank you Hal. very well put and can i ask you helena helena bunquist head of department from the swedish food agency to to also say a few words about the day um, well, first of all, thanks to all the speakers for some interesting view that you've lifted up today and that you've also um, encouraged us to keep investigating. And, um, as we've heard today, like, what I take to say is that PFAS is all around us and all in us. And um, still after today, it really stands out that many questions still remain. We've heard so many answers today, but also some of the questions that arise. The more we learn, the more questions. Uh, 
Well, one example is both the dose of false um, and the mode of action of the computers. If um, the, for example, the dogs, the doses of feedback, that is infected. I'm in sorry, Helena. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you speak closer to the micro microphone? Is the, is, we hear you very bad. Mm, sorry, I'll try to mm, see if I can stop. Um, Okay, go on. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to put I'll try to speak up louder. I'm sorry. It's um, it's already. Uh, okay, so thank you. Well, uh, nevertheless, in conclusion, after all we've heard today, it stands clear for me at least that we need more knowledge and we need more data. So this is to be able to manage this environmental problem correctly and firmly. So what I would like to add to that is to address the problems in a One Health perspective. We need to know uh, the One Health perspective uh, includes environmental health, animal health, and human health, and studies of PFAS transport through the ecosystem and also through the food chain. So from a risk assessment point of view, I also bring with me uh, the challenge. This is a large variety of, of PFAS, more than 10,000 compounds, and uh, can we, and is it actually, um, is it actually possible to risk assess them individually, or do we have to make the joint capacity uh, to risk assessment them as a group of compound? I think it was Steve Balderness that mentioned also that maybe we need to look at the PFAS as a group, uh, or is there other ways of managing the risk, modeling perhaps, or AI? Uh, either way, the PFAS problem has to be managed as effectively as possible and definitely as soon as possible. And to emphasize what Paul just said, that when you release PFAS in the environment, it will sooner or later end up in the food and in us. So setting limit values far down in the chain of events is perhaps not the most efficient way of solving the problem. We need to stop releasing PFAS uh, from the start. So thank you very much, everyone, for a uh, very a fruitful day and good discussions and good knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And can I turn to you, Pia? Pia Makala from Head of Department of the Finnish Food Authority. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you um, um, from my part as well. And I think it, this, this has been really a very, very interesting webinar. And I think we have heard a lot of useful information. And I think it was also nice that all the Nordic countries were involved uh, in this seminar. So um, I think it's a good sign for, for, for our collaboration. But I think um, a lot of things has already been said. And um, but um, I think I'm moving this uh, PFAS issue maybe more from the risk management point of view. And uh, of course, for the food control purposes, I think we need uh, this regular monitoring of PFAS levels in food and uh, also in environment. But uh, on top of that, uh, we need also this targeted sampling for, for the control purposes. And uh, from both of these, um, as mentioned here, I think many times, um, uh, we will get data by which we can really identify the risky foodstuffs and uh, also maybe find uh, these um, hotspots or, or, or contaminated sites. And actually, I, I believe you all know that uh, the European Commission has given recommendations uh, for this kind of uh, PFAS monitoring, and, and I think that uh, that is also helpful. And it's nice to get information then, you know, from all the EU member states. And it was also very welcome uh, that uh, the European Commission recently laid down these maximum levels for PFAS in certain major food categories. Uh, namely fish, uh, meat and eggs, because this will help us also to kind of target our, our, our official controls. And of course, it will enable us to take uh, proper control measures uh, whenever needed. 
And uh, as pointed out several times today, uh, whenever we find these elevated PFAS levels in food, it is very important to find out what is the source of the contamination, eh? because in that way we can we can start to solve the problem. And also we have this opportunity to put in place uh, these appropriate control measures, eh? which I hope or hopefully will, will prevent uh, the problem in the future. And obviously, uh, good collaboration between the control authorities and food business operators is very vital here, as, as, as always, since, of course, we need all the available information and, and capabilities when we, find out, uh, when, when we find out these best methods, uh, how to prevent these PFAS in food. And I believe, uh, as already said here by others, I believe that by working together between the countries and also with the European Commission and EFSA, we will find appropriate ways to control PFAS in food. Uh, and maybe also in the future, we can restrict uh, the use of these substances. Because in my mind, at least we have made a good start and, and we just have to continue with, with, with this, I mean, together as, as we are doing here today. And, and thanks for all the presenters today. I mean, you have excellent presentation, uh, presentations, and I think uh, you've really made the day today, yeah? So thanks. Thank you, Pia, very well put as well. So very many joined for this webinar today, both from the Nordic countries, but also all over Europe and welcome to, and thank you everybody to, to be part of this. I really hope you got the knowledge you expected to both on the analysis and the risk assessment and the risk managers, as you all stated in, in your expectations of the day from the beginning. Uh, I'm quite overwhelmed actually with all the data I've got today, but I really think this is a way forward that we inform our, each other, that we collaborate, that we try to go together and, and solve these issues. We also heard about some of the more uh, enlightening things, like how can we uh, try to avoid it? How can we make an EU ban, maybe? How can we uh, delete some of these uh, uh, or decrease the levels of some of these substances? And I really think we can work forward on, on these things. So this work will continue for the many years to come, and maybe we'll have another webinar, as Havel suggested. But let's see about that. But I'm looking very much forward to following it all. But let's have the last menti.com question of the day. So if you go to menti.com, you can again see a number and put that in. And when you're ready, you can give us a thumbs up. And the last question we want to ask today is, what do you think of the day's webinar? And especially if we're going to make another one, Hal, I would very much like uh, to know what people have thought of it. So again, we do a word cloud. And you can write three words, but only one word in each field, and then push submit and return to the Zoom meeting. And most people still think it's informative, interesting, great, excellent. Great. So, so, so far it's, it's looking good. And food centered, yeah, non-commercial, inspiring. A lot of work, good words coming up here, and we'll look into them all. And as we will look into all the questions uh, and answers, and and see how what knowledge we can get out of that as well. And it's really good to know that you think it was informative and interesting and enlightening, because that was what we were planning to do. All four Nordic organizations. So, I think we all learned a lot today. It was very informative and thank you so much for your active participation. So thank you again and we'll now stop recording and close the webinar and have a very nice day and week as well.